Hello everyone, I'm Dr Paula Bray, the Director of Research at the Sydney Children's Hospitals Network and welcome to our Advanced Therapeutics webinar series where we focus on rapid, the rapidly evolving space that is advanced therapeutics and as it presents innovative and potentially transformational treatments for children now and in future years. Before we get started, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands which we're all meeting on today. This webinar is being hosted from the traditional lands of the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation in the east and the Barramatigal people of the Darug Nation in the west of Sydney. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge the community members, Aboriginal staff, services and organisations who work closely with us to improve the health and well-being of children and young people, their families and communities. So today we have a fantastic lineup of speakers and we are joined by a panel of experts who will guide us through the journey of patients identified with spinal muscular atrophy through newborn screening and receiving treatment with viral mediated gene therapy Zolgensma. The Sydney Children's Hospitals Network was the first accredited Zolgensma gene therapy treatment site in Australia and has been instrumental in providing access to this therapy for children across Australia. Today, you will meet the dedicated clinical team caring for patients receiving gene therapy across our network. Following the presentations, our panel will open for discussion. So please submit any questions through the webinar um, Q&A tab in the Zoom controls at the bottom of your screen. If you see a question submitted that you'd like to have answered, you can also upvote the question by click, clicking the thumbs up besides it. Um, so please do have a look and let us know um, questions as we move through via that function. So now it's my absolute pleasure um, to hand over to Associate Professor Michelle Farah. Um, welcome, Michelle, and over to you. Thank you, Paula, and um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so today, as Paula said, we're talking about the clinical translation of gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy. And just to really acknowledge the large team of people that have been hugely dedicated to this program of work. But moving forward, I think to understand the treatment approach, we need to understand the disease and what is spinal muscular atrophy. So spinal muscular atrophy is a neuromuscular disease and it's caused by an insufficiency of the survival motor neuron protein. And this deficiency results in degeneration of motor nerves that live in the spinal cord. They connect with the muscles and the illness causes muscles to shrink or atrophy causing weakness. And it was the leading genetic cause of infant death. And the incidence is one in 10,000 births and around one in 50 people are actually carriers for it. Now there is a spectrum of severity. The most common is type one. And that is when the diagnosis is made with symptoms that are evident before the age of six months. And without treatment, the day you diagnose the kid would be the best day you see them. And inevitably, there would be progressive weakness and most children would not be alive by the age of two years. So clearly a huge unmet need for treatment. So this graph also helps explain spinal muscular atrophy in terms of the natural history. So in infantile SMA type 1, you can see here that the natural history really does illustrate the short life expectancy. In fact, the median survival in this historical cohort was 13.5 months. And also there is a need for therapy across the spectrum of spinal muscular atrophy. So for those infants with what is called milder phenotypes, so infants that sit but never walk, or infants that walk but may have ongoing weakness and lose that ability without treatment through their life, you can see that there is a progressive deterioration in motor function as depicted by the Hammersmith Functional Motor Scale on the y-axis. So again, it's important to be um, accessing treatment for all patients with spinal muscular atrophy. And through our clinical trial program across Sydney Children's Hospital Network, at the time that we were doing the Nusi Nursen studies, in the same publication in New England Journal of Medicine was a second therapy. 
And this was a phase one study initially in 14 patients. It was open label and it was the gene replacement therapy. And so you can see that the primary outcome of survival is shown on the bottom left. And the historical controls were in the red, but those that received the treatment, survival was 100% throughout the study. And in addition, it, they didn't just survive, they gained motor function in terms of head control, sitting and the ability to stand. So the nice thing about this technology is that it's a single dose intravenously. But you can't just give a child a gene. It needs to be packaged up and delivered. It's like posting a letter. And the way it is done is through a virus, which is the envelope with the address book to the spinal cord. So it crosses the blood and into the brain. So I think the evidence that was emerging was that early diagnosis was important and you could optimise outcomes. And there was... Um, you know, very early data on efficacy for gene therapy, but really it needed to be replicated and further evidence before translation into clinical practice. And that's when the gene therapy program initiated in 2018 at Sydney Children's Hospital. And it was really the chicken on the egg. Um, and it was really coupling the two scientific ideas together early diagnosis to get optimal therapy, where we embarked on a program of work of newborn screening for the early diagnosis of spinal muscular atrophy and early access to the best, um, to gene therapy to really assess the outcomes and to pave a pathway for translation into clinical practice through getting evidence from research to drive change. So now um, I'm just gonna briefly share the outcomes of that first clinical trial. So on a seven gene abapalve effect for pre-symptomatic spinal muscular atrophy. Um, it was called the SPRINT trial and it really was a SPRINT. It was to identify patients, confirm the diagnosis, screen them for a clinical trial and then treat them if they're eligible before six weeks of life. And we really learned how quickly the clock ticks because in fact, 28% of the 30 kids that we identified through newborn screening over the last four years have had early symptoms. But this shows the outcome of pre-symptomatic treatment for um, the children in this study. It really highlights the need for early treatment. So those who were treated with gene therapy and pre-symptomatic at risk of type one SMA, all were sitting and most of them within the normal typically developing time frame and the majority of them were also walking and um, for a third of them that was also within the normal typically developing um, time frame and for those who were at risk of later onset SMA they all achieved independent walking one wasn't video verified and most of them also within the normal typical time frame so taken together, the evidence really informed um, efficacy and safety such that we now have a gene therapy, the first for spinal muscular atrophy that's approved and reimbursed on the PBS with some restrictions. So I'll hand over to Sandy, who's going to take us through that. Thank you, Michelle. So when a child and family are sitting in front of you with a diagnosis of SMA, what are the things that you should be considering before accessing or embarking on accessing gene therapy? As Michelle has um, just um, said, access to gene therapy has now gone beyond the clinical trial domain and has been translated into clinical practice. And I'm hoping to share a few insights into the clinical considerations that have helped us to ensure that the right child accesses the correct disease modifying intervention and that we have done due diligence in assessing the potential for benefits whilst reducing risks. The first thing to understand is that age, disease status and genotype limits for gene therapy treatment differ by jurisdiction. What applies in, for example, America does not apply here in Australia. Here locally, currently there is PBS reimbursement for gene therapy before the age of nine months for children who have genetically confirmed SMA and a two SMN2 copy genotype. 
These are the children who are predicted to have an early infantile onset form and very severe form of SMA. And those are the children that um, Michelle alluded to who don't reach, or the majority don't reach their second birthday if they are untreated. For those with three SMN2 copies, there has to be symptom onset before nine months of age for them to be able to access gene therapy on the PBS. Within an NBS population, so a newborn screening population, we have seen that nearly 40% of our cohort have active signs of disease within the neonatal period, that's between, uh, before six weeks of age. And 80% of these infants have two SMN2 copies. So running diagnostic testing for SMN1 and SMN2 copy number as efficiently as possible is imperative alongside a very detailed neurological and functional examination to determine dis disease status, to ascertain if you can, in the first place, access gene therapy within the restrictions of these health regulations. Beyond that, before you give AAV9 to your children, children should be very comprehensively evaluated for underlying medical conditions, including severe or symptomatic liver disease, thrombocytopenia, that's um, low platelets, or any other serious underlying medical condition that may heighten the risk of AAV9 therapy. For example, active infection may be a risk factor for developing a rare but severe complication, that of thrombotic microangiopathy, or TMA as it's um, otherwise known, whereby you get aggregation of platelets and red blood cells in the small blood vessels of the body, and that can lead to multi-systemic consequences, including quite severe renal failure. There has been a recorded death in the STRIVE EU study, and that's the study where they gave gene therapy uh, for children with infantile onset SMA. And that was secondary to TMA in a child who had gene therapy, but then also developed a respiratory tract infection. So it's a rare but a real, real risk. In our clinical experience, we've had to treat one baby um, who had congenital viral infection and, sure, and ensure that they were free of active viral disease before we could consider and approach the parents for consenting into the gene therapy program. What about the other practicalities? Well, to be eligible to receive on Semnogene Abaparvavec, which is the, the gene therapy for SMA, SMA patients have to be treated or tested, sorry, for the presence of pre-existing anti-AAV9 antibodies which can, in theory, increase the risk of immune responses, resulting in res reduced transduction and limit therapeutic efficacy. AAV9 testing is not currently done locally, so blood samples at the moment are being sent abroad for testing. So that puts in another logistic um, hurdle into our pathway to access gene therapy or ensure that pa patients are properly screened to be eligible for this medication. SMA patients have to have an AAV9 um, antibody titer of no greater than 1 in 50. In newborns, when you're thinking about a newborn screening population, their titers can be high, and that can rep be represented because of the trans uh, placental carriage of antibodies from mum into the baby. And what we have found in our clinical experience is that it's entirely reasonable to repeat um, AAV9 um, titers a couple of weeks um, to see if they have gone down um, to accepted limits post-gestational age. We also always get asked about the theoretical risks of transferring antibodies um, to AAV9 through breast milk. We know the hugely beneficial consequences of breastfeeding, and with no known active risk of transfer of immunoglobulins from the baby's gut into their blood, we continue to recommend uh, breastfeeding before and after on Semnogene Abaparvavec. Now going on to the consenting process. Well, what I have found, I'm sure Michelle will also agree, Consenting parents for gene therapy is rarely a one and done conversation. There are lots of intricacies, intricacies and lots of questions that come up, um, both from uh, the clinician side, but also from the, the family side. In fact, it is a very slow reinforcement of the obvious benefits that Michelle went through in the, the clinical trial slides, but also the risks and uncertainties of this intervention. 
Part of the conversation is the imperative to firstly discuss factors that predict treatment response and provide realistic expectations and goals for the family. And I am very clear when I talk to parents that although gene therapy may stabilize SMA, improve motor outcomes and reduce the comorbidities associated with the disease, there may be ongoing neurodisability. Discussions of potential benefits and risks or burdens of treatment are really needed to manage expectations, especially those for, especially for those infants who have severe motor weakness, respiratory insufficiency and bulbar dysfunction at therapeutic intervention. We have to keep in mind that this is not a cure, um, especially for the children who are symptomatic when they first start therapy. And even for those who don't have signs or symptoms of disease at therapeutic intervention, so those in the pre-symptomatic stage who are expected to have a fairly normal developmental trajectory, I continue to emphasize the need for active surveillance of even subtle manifestations of disease, such as fatigue, such as fatigue and limit, limits in endurance, physical endurance. The emphasis clinically, therefore, has to be continual multidisciplinary coordinated care throughout the patient's life, and that in agreeing to treatment, the family is also agreeing to all recommended safety monitoring and ongoing surveillance. So what forms the basis for informed consent? Well, firstly, as Michelle said, we think this is a one and done administration. But the first thing I let parents know is that the long term efficacy of gene therapy is yet unknown. Side effects that we have observed almost universally are vomiting within the first weeks of administration, usually managed with oral rehydration at home and rarely requiring hospitalization. But you can be um, the parents can be very alarmed when their child just starts vomiting, so they need to know that this is a, a real and probably universal risk. The liver obviously gets the biggest load of viral vector through first pass metabolism, and so the risks of liver dysfunction and thrombocytopenia are well recognized. Rise in liver functions occurs around one to, two, one to two weeks after administration, with a second peak in especially older, heavier children, one to two months post-dosing. Many of these risks are reversible and manageable and reduced by starting steroids one day prior to gene therapy administration, but also by very close clinical and laboratory monitoring in the weeks and months after you give the gene therapy, and especially during the period where you are weaning off the steroids. In jurisdictions where there has not been such close surveillance, I'm talking um, internationally, children have died from fulminant liver failure, especially in that weaning uh, period when they're coming off steroids. It's surprising how long that transaminase um, elevation can persist for, and we have seen it for as long as um, six months within the children that we've treated in the kind of neonatal period, requiring a prolonged course of steroids. And parents should be forewarned of this, that it may not just be a couple of months of steroid cover, it may need to be a longer duration. With these patients, systemic corticosteroids equivalent to prednisolone at one mg per kilo per day should be continued until liver functions are below two times the upper limit of normal and all other assessments return to normal range. And then what we do is we taper the corticosteroid dosage over the next month or so. Beyond these well-documented risks, I also talk about the potentially lesser well-known risks of gene therapy, the chance of myocarditis, for example, TMA that I've just described, and problems with the function of the sensory nerves that have actually been described not in the, um, the phase one to three clinical uh, trials, but in preclinical animal studies. There is also a small but theoretical risk of oncogenesis, and although the SMN1 gene copy that's delivered does not incorporate into the child's DNA, into the nuclear DNA, but sits outside it in an episode, I let families know that we still will continue to surveil the liver for um, any tumours or um, growth through annual ultrasounds. There is emerging real world evidence of efficacy in older and heavier patients. But we, when we have done our own studies, have found that safety signals that I've just described increase with vector load, which is obviously weight dependent. 
The SMART trials are being conducted now where children up to 21 kilograms are being dosed with onsemnogene abapavave, and that will fill the data gap on the risks and benefits of them for, for them in this population. So what I really want to leave you with is that getting the medication to the patient in a streamlined manner is essential. Gene therapy obviously has its significant benefits, but patients, families, and your own expectations have to be informed by those risks and uncertainties. Thank you for your attention. I'll hand it over to Dashina. Sandy. Um, so my name is Deshina. I am the advanced therapeutics pharmacist for the Children's Hospital Westmead Pharmacy Department. And today I'll be discussing our role in treating babies with SMA using Solgen gene therapy. I'll be covering the clinical trials aspects, governance, training, procurement, and preparation involved in administering Solgen. So in terms of development, our first experience with Zolgensma in the clinical trial setting was with the usual ethics protocols. It was a learning curve as an emerging field with local teams having limited gene therapy experience. Pharmacy was involved in discussions regarding the capacity of the organization to participate in the study and as part of the multidisciplinary team to obtain relevant licenses for the site to be part of a study with gene therapy. As mentioned, SEHN treated four babies as an equal top recruitment site globally in its landmark clinical study, which led to its FDA registration. With this clinical trial experience, we then had access to participate in a medication access program until product registration. This was enabled by the newborn screening process mentioned, which shifted the governance from the clinical trials pathway into therapeutic governance, which I'll go into next. So the governance has been discussed in detail in previous webinars. However, I will mention it briefly for the Zolgensma context. The governance of gene therapies is multifaceted. It usually begins with the Therapeutic Goods Administration. So Zolgensma was initially registered in 2019 and approved for Australian use in February 2021, whereby the risk benefit profile of Zolgensma was considered favorably for the therapeutic use approved. The next area of governance is the Office of the Gene Therapy Regulator. We are only able to procure and prepare Zolgensma after being certified by, by the OGTR with a license that is held by Novartis as a product sponsor. Additionally, with the implementation of a new service, there's collaboration across the multidisciplinary team to produce local standard operating procedures. These are per the OGTR license for use by all relevant staff that are involved in gene therapy manufacture and administration. On the right, you'll see some of those that were developed for the organization, including those that are specifically for Zolgensma, pharmacy, nursing, and patients, such as post-dosing instructions and managing side effects. Regarding medication governance, all medications are provided under the auspice of the network's medication and therapeutics committee. Prior to Zolgensma's TJ approval, whilst utilizing the medication access program, we required individual patient use applications approved by the committee. However, after the subsequent PBS approval, it was then allowed to be utilized in the hospital formulary with the relevant PBS restrictions. Next, we require approval from the Institutional Biosafety Committee, that is the gr joint group of scientists between Kids Research and CHW, as the body that assesses risk and provides recommendation on GMO use in the hospital. Lastly, an important part of the pharmacy governance is ensuring that our staff are adequately trained and well prepared in the preparation of gene therapies. I'll talk about this further. So aseptic training is required by all staff involved in gene therapies. This encompasses scrubbing, use of the specialized PC2 facility, and correct aseptic, uh, sterile aseptic technique. Additionally, biosafety training is a requirement of the OGTR and is up to the individual institution to have appropriate training in place. Specifically at CHW, staff require annual biosafety training, specific product training, and good clinic clinical practice certification for participation in clinical trials. 
as well as how to clean a biological spill and what kind of chemicals are required in handling biologicals, therapeutic and waste handling. So once we have our governance and training, we have standardized our gene therapy procurement systems regarding ordering and product custody in accordance with OGTR requirements. For ordering, the process involves the treating team informing us when a baby is being referred for Zolgensma and preparing the necessary dosing checks once the S100 PBS script is received. We do our usual pharmaceutical review and prioritize a purchase order with Novartis, including chief executive approval. CHW Pharmacy has even reconfigured our iPharmacy system to print purchase drug order forms to accommodate all of the zeros in these high cost commercial products, as there wasn't even enough space to print out all the numbers in the drug cost field. The ordering turnaround is usually two to three days. However, as a dose is imported, we prefer a five day window, although this may not always be possible depending on urgency of treatment. We have also configured our medicine management systems for dispensing, ordering, and manufacturing advanced therapeutics products. This includes having built Solgensma order sentences in our medical administration system for each dosing range available for our prescribers, as well as the product being created in our iPharmacy as per specific dosage needs, including unit of measure being in vector genomes per mil with batch production sheets created for record of manufacture. The prescription then needs to be dispensed and approved by the PBS to ensure that the hospital is reimbursed for the total high cost of Zolgensma. We would then close the PBS claim after dispensing to ensure that this occurs in a timely manner. With the custody, arrival of the Zolgensma is carefully coordinated due to the high cost, limited availability and temperature requirements. As such, we are in constant communication with Novartis and the relevant courier company. Once delivered in dry ice, we follow the agreed quality assurance procedures, including inspecting the stock and ensuring there's no temperature deviations. For Zolgensma being utilized within 14 days, it is able to be stored in a monitored two to eight degree fridge in a separate GMO label container. All relevant documentation is then sent to Novartis as license holder for release and the product uh, for use of the product and dose preparation. So in regards to dose preparation, the tra our trained staff assemble all the relevant manufacturing items. The product ideally should be received one to two days prior to administration, so it defrosts in the fridge. However, if this isn't possible, it takes about four hours at room temperature to defrost. Once thawed, Solgensma should be a clear to slightly opaque white liquid free of any particles. The vials that are dispensed correlate exactly to the prescribed dose. As such, it is a straight draw up of the appropriate dosing volume under sterile technique with aseptic conditions, which is done in a class two vertical laminar flow biological safety cabinet. Once the volume in the cap syringe is double checked, the syringe is labeled with an appropriate hazardous labeling and a six hour expiry. It is stored in two sealed plastic bags with absorbent material, then placed in a hard gaze esky that is temperature monitored below 25 degrees for delivery to patient with a biohazard spill kit. The used vial should be disposed of as per biosafety guidelines, and the vials are unable to be refrozen if not used within six hours, so the patient needs to be dosed. Some final considerations and precautions similar to Sandy that Sandy mentioned that pharmacists should be also cognizant of when treating SMA patients are the requirements for corticosteroids prior to and post Solgensma treatment, which I think Sandra will go into discussing next. In regards to precautions, we need to check the patient's vaccination status if appropriate, as it may interact with corticosteroid use, as well as if they have any hepatic and renal impairment, as Sandy mentioned. This is all already evaluated by the medical team, however, should be considered as part of pharmaceutical review. Lastly, vector shedding may occur primarily through body waste, so caregivers and patient families should be advised on the proper handling. And from the for the pharmacy, we liaise with the finance department to correlate all purchase orders with PBS reimbursements for patients to ensure the correct payments. There's also a need to consider institutional governance and the risks involved in accepting patients from other jurisdictions or interstate in decision making. This is especially in regards to treating a patient experiencing adverse effects and subsequent access to services. Lastly, the entire process involves collaboration with not only the specialized clinical trials, aseptic reduction, and clinical pharmacists, but also the neurogenetics team, delivery services, and Novartis all working together in provision of the specialized therapy. And a lot of lessons learned will be able to be applied in future gene therapies. 
Thank you. And I will now hand over to Sandra. Thank you, Deshaina. Share my screen. Thank you. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, talk today. Uh, oh, let's go back up. And I'm going to discuss the management and treatment pathway of children um, who have spinal muscular atrophy and receive gene therapy. First of all, when um, we were first alluded that we were going to be treating children with gene therapy um, for um, spinal muscular atrophy, we were also aware of the timing um, and that motor neurons are lost um, at, a, at an exorbitant rate and the patient can deteriorate before your eyes. So I kind of liken them to the car idling um, at a set of traffic lights and the petrols just wasting, wasting away while they're waiting for the traffic lights to take off. And this is sort of the approach I took um, in organizing um, the Zolgensma um, service and program of how we, um, when we first um, have the notification that a patient needs to be treated, um, we need to go into action. But we can't start at the green. We can't just go and uh, run in and get the car, um, you know, through the traffic light. We have to make sure that it's approached in a safe um, manner and that things are in place um, to ensure a smooth and um, administration um, of Zolgensma and that the entire time the patient and the family, um, you know, are kept at the fore and safe. So um, this was a, a just an original diagram that I came up with when I first uh, took on the role to set up the service for gene therapy. And as you can see there, I took the approach of um, the pre from pre-administration, the people involved, treating medical officer, um, which would be the neurology consultant in this instance, the registered nurse um, dealing with the actual patient and the administration of the drug to the patient, and then the medical officer, which could be their local GP um, or neurologist or pediatrician. Um, to who would be working with us from, um, from afar. Pharmacy um, in the middle to make sure everything gets checked and placed, then the administration process in green to give it, and then blue in to monitor it. I've broken these down a little bit more to explain. So first of all, plan it. The pre-treatment, as soon as we know that a child needs, um, is we need to inform the family and there's a lot of planning behind that because these children often don't live locally. And as the first service um, to be able to give gene therapy Australia-wide, um, there's you know, trips to be planned and people are coming from long distances and that needs to be taken into consideration. We've treated people, um, families um, as far as away from Perth and um, Melbourne and Brisbane and South Australia. Um, here at Sydney Children's Hospital and liaising for that to be done uh, is a huge undertaking. Sandy alluded to the fact that we need to do AUV9 teeters and in order for the families to try and cut down on traveling, um, these were organized through local labs when and if possible. Um, at the moment, our teeters still go off to the Netherlands and this, again, we are aware there's a time um, lag and that needs to be taken in consideration with the pre-treatment planning. So once we have all of those things in place, I can then coordinate with the clinical staff to ensure that I've got space, that we've got the right equipment, that the local team know that the patient's um, going to be requiring um, an admission and IV access, and all of those things need to be put in place before we can move forward. So a lot of pre-treatment planning goes on before the patient even steps foot uh, in the hospital. Once we've done that, I can then move on to the pre-administration part and check that everything's been put in place. So the patients were identified, um, they have a comprehensive consult as Sandy alluded to, and the consenting process takes place. Um, all the bloods, uh, pre-monitoring bloods are done for baseline so we know um, and can monitor for changes post-dosing and education of the family. So a lot of time is put into this, educating them to meet realistic expectations 
And I think that's quite important. As Sandy said, this is not a cure. The child still um, has a diagnosis of, it, of SMA. And not all of the children that have been treated have been treated in the newborn period. So we've had treat, children treated as old as, um, you know, seven and nine years old. And obviously they have, uh, you know, disease uh, phenotype prior to treatment. So I think that dealing with the expectations in this pre-administration phase uh, can be quite helpful and it can alleviate some fears and uh, stresses um, for the team and the family. So then once all that's all in place um, and we've checked all of the, you know, crossed all of our T's and dotted our I's, we can then move on to dosing. The, um, the infants themselves or children will start on prednisolone 24 hours um, before dosing day. Um, they may or may not start on some anti-reflux medication and they will, um, such as omeprazole, and they will be given um, a script for endansetron for um, and as anti-emetic. And as we said, I think probably 98% of all patients treated with Zygensma have had vomiting in the post-treatment period. Uh, infants will come in early in the morning. They arrive at around 8.30, in the, 8:30 to um, our medical day only ward. And the first um, priority of that day is to get IV access for these children. Now we've always, um, as a safety precaution, um, given uh, admit, inserted, sorry, two IV access cannulas. Um, and that is because when the dose turns up, you only have a shortened time frame. Uh, in which it can be delivered. And if it, the IV tissues through that infusion, then we have a backup straight away to transfer um, that over. And also too, if there's some adverse event that occurs during the infusion, we have an alternative IV access in case there's any emergency drugs required. This uh, thankfully has not happened um, at any point in, in regards to an AE during infusion. Um, but we have had one dose where the uh, cannula leaked and we had to transfer and use our second IV access. Um, on that day, once the IV access is obtained, we then notify uh, Dashina in the lab and they will go ahead and reconstitute up the uh, dose for us, which had already been pre-ordered. So they have the kit ready, they'll um, get the dose ready and then we'll be liaising with the courier to deliver the dose to us. Um, and that usually happens in a, in a good timely manner. And by around midday of that day, we have the dose ready um, to administer. It's administered over an hour. It's given via a syringe pump. During that time, the patient is monitored on a um, pulse oximetry, um, pre-administration baseline OBS are done, blood pressure, temperature, respiratory rate, heart rate, and saturations. And they are monitored for, monitored for the entire time of the infusion and for four to two hours post-infusion, depending um, on the patient and um, on our reviews. Um, the parents are able to stay with the patient. They can hold the patient. Um, so they feel very safe and um, part of the process. So I think that is also um, helps to alleviate fears in the family. From a... Um, medical perspective during the um, putting up of the infusion, full PPE is worn um, in the way of a mask, uh, gowns, goggles, uh, gloves, um, no shoe protectors are required. Uh, however, it's done in a non-touch um, non technique and I will already have a syringe of, of normal saline running in the cannulas and it'll be just through an infusion pump. And then it would just be a matter of exchanging the syringe over to the um, Zolgensma, um, running that over an hour and then flushing the line um, afterwards to ensure the patient has received the, to the total dose. Um, PPE does not need to be worn during the infusion time, just for connection and disconnection. Um, if you do have an active patient and the, the parent would like to nurse the patient during the infusion, we would recommend that the parent wear um, a gown um, and in our current climate, we're all wearing masks, um, but we would ask them to wear a gown during that time in case the um, cannula or the infusion dislodged or leaked. 
um, whilst they were holding the parent, holding the child. If the child um, remains in their bed, um, I don't find a need for them to do this. So that's on the green. We've got the go ahead. We've given the dose and we're monitoring the entire time and we're keeping them for, as I said, two to four hours post dosing. If all's gone well with the day, we then discharge the patient and we will review them and see them within 48 hours back as an outpatient. On that day, they leave with a variety of resources. They will leave with um, some fact sheets. Um, they will leave with things uh, to look out for and observe, and that will be things like vomiting, um, a decrease in fluid intake or food intake, a decrease in wet, wet nappies, uh, any signs of bruising that has just, or rashes that come up um, without any trauma, exact example of toddler falling, um, and we'll get them to um, make a good eye on their nappies and any reduction in urine output or the colour of, um, of the urine. That's really important because, as I said, vomiting has occurred in, in you know, about 98% of our patients and dehydration um, can quickly ensue, in, especially in the little ones. And we want to make sure that all times um, that they're well hydrated because we know that that can then lead on to um, a TMA and um, you know, reduction with the reduction in platelets, um, et cetera. Once they become dehydrated, it can be very difficult to keep to chase their fluids and um, you know, ensure that they uh, don't get sick. There's the, the vector, as Dashina um, said, on the AAB9 uh, sheds for approximately 30 days and parents are given um, instructions about wearing gloves and strict hand um, washing and uh, in, in regards to bodily fluids, especially the nappies, um, urine and, and feces and the vomit. If the ch child's continuously vomiting, we ask the parents to wear gloves um, and just to make sure that they are uh, adhering to strict hand washing. They will also be given forms for um, uh, vaccination um, uh, medical exemption. Um, that's really important for families because uh, a lot of families are receiving um, payments or benefit, uh, childcare payments, and Medicare will cease their payments if the child um, does not meet their immunization schedule. So families are very thankful to receive uh, the medical exemption forms, which are on the Medicare website, and they can be filled out and given to the families. The families can then uh, put these, uh, register these with Medicare, and their payments will not be um, ceased during that time until the child, um, you know, has their catch-up schedule. Um, Parents are also to make sure that they call us if at any point the child cannot maintain their steroid dose daily. Um, we give them instructions. If they the child vomits, vomits it up within half an hour, we ask them to repeat the full dose. If they vomit later in the day, we ask them not to repeat it. Um, and if they can't keep a dose down at all for the day, they would um, call us or contact us and we will um, make an assessment whether they are to present to emergency. Um, and that leads me to the fact that they will also have a letter for the emergency department and on their electronic medical records, we will make a note um, to make sure that if they present to um, ED that they um, have an alert on their thing, on their forms that they have presented um, post gene therapy administration and who the main contact people would be um, for assessment and care of them if they present to ED as they might require uh, extra steroids or um, uh, you know, specific management or an admission to the ward for fluids. So that's all on the day. And then on the, when they come back in 48 hours, we start monitoring um, all of the um, looking out for any And I think the main part of that is the parents are given urine bags. We would test their urine every time they come in. We will do their blood pressure and their weight to make sure they're not dropping weight, especially if they're vomiting. Um, and we'll be looking for all of those kind of things. So part of my job is to help set up the individualized medical care plan 
um, which is imperative for them ongoing and for them to be returning home. We will usually do bloods three times at least in the first week. Um, so sort of every 48 hours uh, within the first week and probably every 72 hours in the second week. And if they're from interstate, we like them to stay close to our tertiary centre um, and we'll sort accommodation um, for them in order for them to do that. And at the end of that two week period, if the, everything has gone um, to plan and the child is well and not vomiting, uh, we will make arrangements for them to return locally to their local paediatrician and neurologist um, who will then take over care. And that's been quite a successful um, approach. And we've had lots of our children then continue to be monitored uh, locally and close to home, which of course the families appreciate because that's where their support um, networks are. I think when they're here, we always, uh, I always offer to engage them with social workers and psychologists to assist the families to um, this, the care setting outside of their comfort zone, uh, outside of their local area to help with them re possibly reduce anxiety, or if they've left toddlers home with grandma in another state, you know, that can be quite um, difficult for the family. So I think that's a really important part um, and holistic approach to these families coming to us for this um, specific treatment. And I think, um, you know, that it's it's uh, a good a good service, uh, you know, definitely say once this is happening in your centres to offer that. Um, we engage allied health teams, of course, as Sandy alluded to, to maximise um, outcomes, both motor skill, fine and gross motor skill, respiratory and cognitive outcomes, um, as you would any child with um, SMA. I think... Um, the, the post-treatment period can go on for many months um, in an acute phase as long as, as long as they're still on steroids. So they'd be on steroids for a minimum of 30 days. We're monitoring LFTs um, and full blood counts and platelets very closely to look for transaminitis. Um, and that can often be without symptoms in the patient, but we would still um, be monitoring steroids and adjusting them accordingly. So. Um, they may go from one milligram per kilo up to two, in, you know, in the worst case scenario, four milligrams per kilo. And then obviously the reduction and weaning of these steroids needs to be done in a safe um, and efficient manner and still being monitor monitored um, regularly with bloods until they completely wean off their steroids. Ideally, this would just be for a period of 60 days, 30 days on maximum dose and 30 days to wean. Um, but we have had patients who have gone on to have steroids uh, for upwards of, um, you know, longer than a year. So I think that's just a really important um, to know that the post-treatment period just doesn't end in the first two weeks, that it, it um, can be very ongoing as far as acute um, management. And then it will move on to more um, their usual treatment pathways for a child with SMA um, that they may have received pre-dose if they were um, an older child being treated or if they're a newborn that we've managed to treat. We still make sure um, we're looking for symptoms, um, symptom development um, and obviously progress and hopefully um, meeting all their milestones in the future. So I think that's really important. I think the considerations in learning um, that I would take away from this is that Zolgensma gene therapy was safe overall and well tolerated, especially in the younger patients. And again, that I think was alluded to um, by Sandy that the bigger the volume and the more you weigh, probably the more vector load and side effect profile that you'll have. During all of this time of treatment and over the last three years, we've had COVID and there have been uh, lots of considerations to take into place with that, with border passes and being required um, and just keeping the family and the child well. So once dosing day has been planned, that they can actually arrive and, and get that in a safe manner. Um, the processes and approval for Zogensma have been varied across the last three years and it can be very time consuming. And we know that time in neurons and as a team, we all strive to, to make this as um, you know, streamlined as possible with the, knowing that the baby and the family are, are at the other end of this. 
um, again, saying that making sure that they stay well, dealing with the parental fears and anxieties in a realistic manner, I think is really important from the onset. This is not a cure, um, but it is, a, it is an amazing treatment and something that I never thought that I would see in my years of um, nursing um, with uh, children with SMA since 2008. So it's quite incredible. Um, vomiting and dehydration have to be taken seriously to avoid complications. Uh, immunizations should not be given within four weeks of dosing and held four weeks post-steroid cessation. Um, monitoring of the child continues well beyond dosing, as I said. Gene therapy had never been given on such a large scale at SCH, and we went through some steep learning curves. We've all survived and got out the other end. And what it leaves us now with is a workforce that has to stretch their resources to now encompass this new cohort of patients who require follow-up and care outside of the normal re of requirements. And I think for most centres, this is the this is where we're all going to be stretched um, as advanced therapeutics start, um, you know, becoming part of normal treatment pathways. Uh, we now have to work out how can we maintain those and uh, maintain those services. Um, with our already, um, you know, stretched resources. And finally, future comorbidities are still unknown. Um, and, you know, we're looking to the future and gathering more evidence um, to see, you know, where these patients lie um, in the future. So I'd just like to thank you all for um, listening and I'd like to pass on to Michelle. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Um, so really, um, I was going to talk about the post-dosing post care, but um, Sandra's done a lovely job. Um, so just really, I think that safety is important. And in fact, it's the education of families that is essential in the safety journey and the post-treatment monitoring so spending the time to educate them around what symptoms to monitor and how to manage symptoms if they do emerge. And our experience has been that while there can be symptoms, they are usually mild and able to be managed very safely. But there is a structured format for post-treatment monitoring. And I really think that a lot of this is about understanding the technology and the science. And so the AAV9 virus is the envelope and it will induce an immune response. And that, mm -hmm. that is part of the reason why we do the antibodies before, because if you're already immune to it, the treatment won't work. So um, you'd be recommending an alternate therapy. So you, with the immune response, there can be an innate immune reaction a um, complement mediated immune reaction and then a T cell mediated immune reaction. Oh. And really, I think initially it's the innate one. And that really, I think is manifested by initial fevers and the vomiting that can happen. And really if vomiting does happen and there's dehydration, that is a risk factor to exacerbate any further immune reaction with a pre-renal um, dehydration. So it, it can make any further side effects exacerbated, but it doesn't really set the backdrop that it leads into them. But it's just optimising the health of the baby so that they tolerate it and minimise any um, and, and mitigate any side effects that do emerge. So you can see here that this is a graph of some of the first children that we treated in terms of transaminitis. And I think there's a couple of important messages here. The first is that there are two peaks, as you saw initially in the second week, and then around day 30. Um, and I think they're mediated by different processes, um, but they are transient. And really the green is the children that were under eight kilos and the red those that were over eight kilos. And the younger children had less side effects and like this could be weight-based. And it really, to me, emphasises the critical role of newborn screening in early access to treatment. It's not only that the children um, do better because of the pathophysiology of spinal muscular atrophy, but they also tolerate the treatment better. And in fact, a lot of the newborns, um, some of them don't experience any side effects at all, in fact. 
Um, but I think it's important that after day 30, when you think you might be starting to wean the steroids, that you're continuing to monitor very closely um, and um, only reducing steroids should the liver function be normal and that families need to understand the um, necessity for follow-up. There can be a drop in platelets in the first two weeks and then they usually recover. The cases that we have seen with thrombotic microangiopathy, we've learned that the clinical manifestations are characterised usually around day five to day six with vomiting, a reduction in urine output and possibly bruising. And educating the family about those symptoms and monitoring them and presenting for attention is really important. But it, um, And then I think an assessment, thinking about this as a diagnosis is important. And I think in recognising it early, you can also reduce the seriousness of this, even though it is a potentially serious side effect. So early fluid restriction, close management of hypertension. The other clues are monitoring the urine because there might be proteinuria and hematuria as early signs. So I think it does take a team. There's a thousand players involved, um, but being proactive and focusing on safety and the child at the centre of this and also caring for the family because this is stressful and part of the team is the psychosocial care for the family as well. So in terms of um, wrapping up, um, I think there's a couple of lessons that we can all learn from. I think globally, there are still barriers in accessing timely treatment for SMA, and it's important that we're aware of this and advocating for our patients. But really, early diagnosis is important. There is an urgency to treat, particularly at those of um, risk of developing type 1 SMA. It's important to spend time to understand and manage caregiver expectations and education. But it also takes a team of expertise across many different fields to deliver the care immediately and also into the long term. So SMA remains a serious neurological disease, but now it is treatable with several disease modifying therapies. And underpinning that is early diagnosis coupled with intervention. And that together can maximise clinical outcomes. And that's best achieved through newborn screening. But the newborn screening is identifying patients, communicating and confirming a diagnosis, and then promptly initiating therapeutic intervention. So it's an end-to-end -end care plan. And after patients are treated, some of them will have ongoing weakness and they will require multidisciplinary care and interdisciplinary team into the future. Thank you very much. Back to you, Paula. Thank you, Michelle. Um, excellent. So I just want to say a huge thank you to all of our speakers. Um, what fantastic presentations and it's incredible to see where the journey has, has gone to from the original webinar that we um, ran regarding this therapy and, and to where you are today. And I'm really hopeful that um, as we start to embed these therapies moving forward, we can collectively use these learnings to improve care and hopefully look at our um, ability to respond as a health system in terms of our readiness for, for these new precision therapies. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Laura Fawcett, who is a respiratory consultant and, a, and the Advanced Therapeutics Medical Lead at the Sydney Children's Hospital, who will facilitate a Q&A session today. Um, I noticed we had one question which has moved to answers answered, and I'd just like to encourage you all, if you have any questions for the panel, please do um, pop them into the Q&A. And I will hand over to you, Laura. Uh, yeah, please send through your questions, otherwise it'll be me just grilling the team. Um, but we might just start with a bit of a slightly open question about what's next for the this population of patients. Um, there's some fantastic therapies available now um, for, for SMA, for SMA um, babies and adults and, um, and other, other groups. Um, but what's next? What do we have to do to make it even better? I'm going to throw that open to to everybody to jump in first but maybe Sandy might start us off. Um, I think that's a great question. I think it's about um, now the cohort that have already had the gene therapy Laura, I think it's now getting them back into that multidisciplinary care model and optimizing the outcomes. So um, as we alluded to 
some of these children, especially the symptomatic ones, even though they're treated early, they still have ongoing weakness. We're seeing new phenotypes emerging. They may have other comorbidities such as um, need for enteral support, feeding support, respiratory support. So we still have to be mindful. So now that we've got disease modification, I think it's even more of an imperative to get that multidisciplinary care on board so we can get the best outcomes, get the best out of those agents. Um, and then we are hoping through um, what we're doing in terms of research to figure out whether these um, agents are impactive from a health outcome point of view, cost effective, that we can help to shift health policy and practice as well. Because at the moment, it's the gene therapy is only reimbursed for a proportion of children. Um, so under nine months, if you're symptomatic and two copies, you get it. If you're pre-symptomatic and three copies and discovered by newborn screening, you actually don't have recourse to any of the disease modifying interventions. And we're trying to build evidence from the research point of view that that there should be a shift in that thinking, especially for the three copy pre-symptomatic newborns through health and policy advocacy. Thanks, Andy. We've got a couple of questions coming through, but Michelle, did you want to add on? I mean, the what's next, I think just to emphasize the story is not over. I think there's more questions and answers now. And it really highlights the importance of research integrated into clinical care to be able to begin to answer these questions. Uh, some of them, you know, that we get asked every clinic is, well, which treatment's best? How do I know if the treatment is actually working? When do I change treatments? And we really need a scientific understanding to be guiding these questions, to be rational and evidence-based. And I think the landscape has changed so quickly that the um, continuing to understand therapeutic response and measure it and look at long-term outcomes is actually really important to be able to answer these questions that are really important for parents. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, so maybe um, Sandra, um, Sandra, you might be able to answer this one um, about um, the um, Australian states. Do they all have newborn screening for SMA? Ah, no, they don't yet. And actually, New South Wales and ACT currently are the only states that have newborn screening for SMA. Um, Queensland are hoping to be on board with that, I believe, in March 2023. Uh, Victoria are on hold. They still haven't said when they might be. And I think Perth is coming on about May uh, 2023. Even though um, Greg Hunt's parting gesture was to make a recommendation that all states adopt newborn screening for SMA, it's still under state jurisdiction. And we can't understand why, um, you know, such a, a simple test, which is fairly inexpensive and does include um, some another couple of um, diseases it, uh, not being adopted by the states and I think this is another thing we're working hard with advocacy groups um, to really fight for them uh, to get newborn screening and the fact that within Australia there's still an equity of access um, to newborn screening for SMA and therefore uh, disease modifying therapies for these um, you know these uh, newly diagnosed infants uh, just mind boggles it, it me, um, you know, that, that this can happen within Australia and I can't understand why. Um, obviously in Europe and stuff, you can understand that, but within Australia, I just can't, it, I just can't understand. So I'm really, um, you know, hoping, you know, working with advocacy and getting more evidence to support that we treatment, early treatment is paramount. Um, you know, hopefully that will support the case for other states to um, get newborn screening adopted. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Anne. Does anybody else want to add on anything about the newborn screening? Well, I think just that it has been um, recommended for national adoption, but this is the first DNA-based test within the newborn screening lab. So it is not 
that you recommend it and it's immediately able to be done. <laughs> so I think every state is making steps towards that, which is really promising and amazing. And it is um, they are doing it in a way that can be high quality because this is you are calling parents that believe their baby is perfect you have to be sure and so getting the assay right getting the equipment into the lab and training the staff is absolutely essential and it took new south wales several months to be ready and that is what is happening in other states right now it's not that nothing's happening they are making moves towards it in a high quality safe way because newborn screening is a program with high public trust and we need to maintain that trust. Thanks, Michelle. We've got a question here from Kerry West, who's asked about how can we get more support for the allied health teams now that have to be involved a lot more in the follow-up of this patient group? Who wants to take that one? Sandy, you've got, you're, you're muted. <laughs> um... Look, I think it's always about investing in people. Um, it is no mean feat to follow up these families and to follow up these babies, every single baby. I mean, we see them post-administration every other day for the first couple of weeks. And then every um, two, uh, on two days, you know, thereafter. So, and we've got the physios coming in, we've got the social workers, it is not a small feat to do that. And I think the way that this has now gone from clinical trial into clinical practice, we need to follow that with investment in expertise, in people. And as Michelle said, marrying that with research to say that what we are doing is right for our patients, it's effective. Um, you know, how can we make changes to make the uh, process efficient, the implementation better, um, more cost effective, but at the end of it, keeping that child and family very much at the center. But I don't think there's any easy, uh, any easy answer to that apart from investment. Thanks, Andy. Okay, next question from Mary Claire War is um, about what is the current follow up period? So how long have we followed up these patients for so far? So the first patient we treated is now four years old. Overseas, um, I think the patients are getting on to seven or eight years of age. That's fantastic. What have we learned from those, those patients so far? What are we seeing? Every patient is different and understanding the individual characteristics that help predict outcome is really important. Um, because at every parent says, is my child going to walk? And beginning to pull, pick that apart to be able to answer that rather than say, I don't know, is really important. Um, we do know that children with two copies, which predicts a severe phenotype, um, some do, some, I think the outcomes aren't always perfect but they're still amazing. So they do need ongoing follow-up and care. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, our next question is about um, what other therapies are available for patients who are not eligible for gene therapy? So um, Dashina, do you want to jump in first? Or am I asking a tricky one for you? I think that is a tricky one. We usually guided by um, the medical team, Michelle and Sandy, in terms of what um, would be the most appropriate options for the patient. So I might know pass it over to you guys and then we deal with the other side of it well I, I think really just to say first of all that it's not the best treatment okay all treatments work and I think the best treatment is the first treatment and it really comes down to the individual characteristics of the child and the preferences of the family and what is most clinically suitable but for patients that aren't eligible for Zolgensma for whatever reason, and there are many, um, there's two other approved therapies that are equally as efficacious. They vary on their frequency and route of administration, but there is no comparative study to say one is superior than the other. So we're in a very privileged position to be able to have three different therapies that are all very effective. 
Thanks, Michelle. Um, a couple of questions about where the therapy is being offered in Australia. So um, would it only continue to be offered through SCH or uh, other centres working on setting it up? And so then what will be the outcome if other states have newborn screening? Will babies have to continue to travel? So I think, Michelle, you might want to start. That one. Yeah, I think really to say that this, um, the journey really highlighted how research and clinical practice aren't happening in silos. There's a strong overlap. We were still recruiting for the clinical trial when the FDA approved it, and we were getting inquiries to access it immediately. And it is a time-sensitive drug with a cutoff age for ineligibility, so that was important. Um, but... Melbourne is a treatment site and they are treating patients as well and um, it is a complex drug and there's training and approval processes that need to be put in place and um, working with the drug company um, further treatment centres will be established around Australia because we realise it's important to highlight safety but also care for the family and timely treatment is also very important. And I, what I think the beauty of this model is that it's we've got so many learnings and people are so eager to learn and we're so eager to disseminate what we have learned. And it, I mean, SMA is a rare disease, but actually we're using this experience from newborn screening and advanced therapeutics and now taking it as using it as a template in other diseases. So it's not just about SMA and advanced therapeutics and SMA, but it really is going to be a replicable model um, as these advanced therapeutics emerge very quickly on our horizon. And I think for kids research, for SCHN to be at the real center of that, that's pretty amazing. It's a very privileged position for us to um, help the, help Australia um, come to the party. Thanks, Andy. Um, on the kind of the theme of newborn screening, is there in utero screening? Um, is that something that's on the horizon? Has it already been done? It's there, and how would that impact the care of these babies? Yes, it is being done, and that's usually if there's a family history of spinal muscular atrophy. Um, parents will know that they are carriers and that they're at risk of having an affected child and they may elect to have a prenatal diagnosis. Um, and in that case, um, we can be as prepared as possible to offer treatment to that child. Um, and then there's options like reproductive carrier screening where couples can choose to know if they're at risk of having an affected child and make decisions around how they would like to have a family with that. So the options are opening up um, enormously, um, but really I don't think we can give in utero gene therapy. So that's a challenge that is just a bit too far for me. Thanks, Michelle. I've got one here um, specifically for you, Dashina, about pharmacy. Um, so is this therapy one that can only be, be, pre be prepared in a large tertiary centre? There seems to be quite a lot of specific pharmacy requirements involved. Um, that's a great question. I think that um, the, the requirements are per what we are um, sort of informed by the OGTR and the license holder Nevada. So they are the ones that sort of work with us and the sites. So it's potentially more larger centers. Um, however, if smaller centers have the capability to meet those requirements, um, that's including things like our monitored fridges for our, the high, to store the high cost drugs, as well as the PC2 labs and the laminar flow that's also required as part of the licenses, then those sites could potentially, but it's very unlikely that a smaller site would have access to those facilities. So it's more likely that we would see it in our larger centers. Thanks, Dashina. Okay, I see Michelle that you're you're typing in an answer there to to Mary Claire's question. Um, do you want to to go to answer that live for us? Obviously, it's just disappeared off my screen. Yeah. So the question was, what's the four year follow up data? And it really depends on the clinical status of the child. Um, but there hasn't been any evidence of loss of efficacy so far. Uh, thanks, Michelle. So are we at time, Paula? Are we? Yeah. We are indeed. So thank you so much, everyone. I thought we could just get through those questions before I gave the one question 
time out. So um, first and foremost, I really um, want to extend our absolute gratitude to the speakers. I know it's an incredibly busy time of year. So thank you all for taking time out of your days um, to speak today. Um, just to let the attendees know there will be a video of the webinar that will be available via the website and um, on the Sydney Children's Hospitals Network YouTube channel. And there'll also be a short survey at the end. So if you do have a couple of minutes to fill it out, please do. We really appreciate your feedback for future webinars. Um, and as I said, I really want to extend um, our absolute heartfelt thanks to the panel and to our Q&A facilitator today, Laura. Thank you so much. It was um, fantastic. And certainly to our contributors, including Luminous Alliance, and most importantly to all of you for being here today and, and your active participation with the questions. Um, so thank you all. I hope you all have a wonderful and safe festive season. This is our last webinar for the year. So we really look forward to having you join us again for our Kids Advanced Therapeutic web webinar series in 2023. So goodbye from all of us today um, and have, as I said, uh, hopefully a, a restful season. Thanks, everyone.